Okay, set number 32 is in. That is in nature's set number 32. This is the cling foam version. It also comes in and mounted. Um, let's see. I'm going to be testing here for impression quality and detail retention when it comes to um, the engraving process, the mold making process, and uh, Let's see um, if uh, the stamps are retaining as much information as I hoped they would when I design them. When you're designing stamps, you're always kind of looking for um, kind of the amount of detail to, um, oh, kind of to design into, especially the negative space within designs and uh, how much of that to have, how tight to put to the, the detail, knowing that you know, a, a, an engraving is going to have to be made, which is this, it's not really an engraving, it's more of an, it's an etching, which is an acid bath kind of a removal process of excess uh, material to, oh, retain the image itself. So you have this plate that's raised, you know, uh, a metal plate that's raised, and that gets pressed into this thing called Bakelite or they call it matrix. And um, that is your mold and it's a negative space one. And then from there, they put it through a vulcanizer with a sheet of rubber on top and it presses into that negative space um, mold. And that's where you get your rubber stamps from. It's an in sheet form. For something like this, they mount that whole sheet to a piece of cling foam. This one happens to be the 1 8 inch cling foam, and um, it will adhere to your blocks or your um, stamp position or whatever you happen to use with your um, cling foam stamps. If you're just using bare rubber, you'll want um, something like you know, tack and peel on your um, blocks for that temporary um, bond of unmounted rubber like that. Not on this size block, but that gives you the idea. Okay, so anyways, that is my first impression with my Ocotillo, and I can see, and let's see if I can show you in here. There are these little, kind of those little ribs I don't know if I can zoom in too far with this, but you can see it right here. I wanted this for the most part silhouette, but I don't do complete silhouette stamps usually because I want some lighting retention in there for kind of more of a three-dimensional type of look. There's a little bit more information in there, but I just re-inked my black pad here. Um, let's try the... Uh, the two Sawaros here. Did I say Okatio? Yes, yeah, some nice dual Sawaros, the larger ones right here. They're in different sizes, so um, we can create depth within a given space, okay? There we go right there. Some good depth retention. Okay, so far so good. I can pretty much tell, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I can tell when, uh, you know, some stamps have come out exactly the way I want them to. And I could pretty much tell looking at this, eyeballing it. But you never know, you know. Um, um, that space, um, you want to test for things like um, image depth as well. Um, you want your stamps raised as high as possible. You can't have them raised too far though because you're going to have this breaking down in that all those steps of, uh, of uh, you know, generations, they call it, generations between the original art and the final result. Um, the higher it is, um, the less prone the stamp is to having um, ink be applied to some of that base area around your design, okay? Uh, but you can't have it too far, otherwise you're going to have a breaking down of kind of detail, potentially, from all those generations away from the original. 
Okay, here's the small dual Sawaros right here. Okay, yeah, that's looking pretty good. That's what I wanted right there. I'm not trying to create scenes here. I'm just checking for a kind of impression quality of all the designs. Okay, here's another, here's the lone, um, kind of more medium sized Saguaro right here. Let's check for that. I've over inked my stamp pad a little bit. It looks good. I can see the uh, image um, quality. I'm also checking on the perimeter and silhouette here, you know, which is never any problem with, but you know, you always want to uh, make sure. And you're also making sure that there isn't any kind of uh, abnormalities with the um, plate, like when they um, print out your imagery onto a magnesium plate and then they put it, imagine this is the plate. Okay. And they're, Imagine it's magnesium and they print this onto the plate. Okay, and that ink that they put on there um, resists the acid bath that are that's being put in there. But sometimes like um, if there's like a little blotch of something in there, I'm looking for those types of things too. But I can just eyeball this and I can see there's nothing there. Uh, my rubber guy tests, you know, checks for that as well when he gets uh, the... Uh, the plate in. I don't have it sent to me first and then sent to my rubber. My rubber guy's been doing this for, you know, a gazillion years. Okay, so let's check for the small Octio right here. Okay, this could be one in the distance. Um, that retention detail is super right there. I can see these little tiny arms. See, it's on things like this. This is the stuff that I'm really testing for here. I, I The larger ones aren't really going to have any kind of issues, but when you get into really small forms, you want that line weight to be fairly thin because it's going to be in the distance, but you don't want to make it so thin that um, like a little tiny squiggly line or something like that is going to be broken up. You know, there's going to be a, a missing spot in there because again, of all those generations away from the original um, that you're, that you're, you know, you've gone, you know, you have the original, then you have the magnesium plate, you have the uh, matrix or mold, and then you have the pressing of the rubber, and then you have your print made from your rubber stamp. So that's four generations away from that original artwork, and that's quite a bit, you know, with this entire process, but... You know, it's an old process too. It's not like, okay, there's like all this technology now. Um, the only different technology, technological thing is um, you upload your digital designs as opposed to submitting originals these days, like original prints or something like that. Thank heavens for that, you know, that they've t removed that type of thing of, you know, submitting original artwork. We used to have to go get high resolution, like copies made of your stamp uh, print it out several times and you do this layout of how you want all these things. So you're manually kind of gluing these things down and then mailing in an original. And, uh, you know, so that added in a whole, um, other, um, generation to it. And it's, you know, when you're talking about colored laser copies, you know, it's not, you know, a very ideal. Okay, so I, I, one of the things I didn't do on this um, sheet right here, I don't have a lot of super solid um, silhouette-y types of things. I guess the Sawaros were a little bit like that. But sometimes, you know, when your stamps are new, um, and if you're using like super wet ink or something like that, it's going to fill in in the details like that. Um, or super juicy pads, I should say, not wet ink. It's always wet, but, um, you know, sometimes when you get your, your stamps, you want to kind of, kind of rub off the surface a little bit. You can put a, like a wet paper towel and just kind of take your stamp and just kind of go like this with it. I, sometimes I just do it on a, just a blank piece of paper like this. So you can remove some of the resist that's used, you know, to remove the stamps from the mold. Okay. 
Otherwise, you might get some kind of irregularities in there, but you don't really have to do that except for um, images that have a really large kind of solid area. Okay. All right, so this is the type of thing that I'm looking for right in here. It's all those little details in that saguaro. So I didn't make these, um, you know, completely silhouette either. I put some detail within this base right here. Otherwise, that would just look like a big blob of nothing, you know, in there. But you really want all that little kind of, I don't know, that those spines and the uh, the texture of the uh, Ocotillo, not the saguaro, okay. Uh, the, the Ocotillo in here, and it, not all kind of, I don't know what you call these, branches are the same on these. Um, and the one in the distance, you can't put so much detail in, you know, the middle of one branch, but you can in the, the closer up ones like this. Sorry about the uh, focus right there. But um, yeah, and then I'm looking all around here. I wanted it a little bit kind of, you know, spiny and shaggy, you know, with those. Um, this one's supposed to represent kind of one that's kind of in the spring. It has all these little um, kind of, you know, blooms on the top of it like that. But um, I'm looking around the base, especially in like right there at the foot and seeing that little growth and grass around at the base right there. And it's perfect. It's exactly what I had hoped for, you know, when you're designing it and kind of making some design decisions. All right. So those are the Ocotillos. Okay. I've had both of them on my mind. So I'm, you know, I'm saying... Uh, Forgive me for if I said Ocotillo, where it was Saguaros and Saguaros, where it's the Ocotillo here. I've seen a lots of Ocotillo. They don't have too many. Um, I don't know. Maybe there's some on the border, but I don't see too many um, Saguaros, at least in the areas that you know, the high, uh, the um, the desert areas that I've been to uh, hiking a lot in. All right, so these are my little um, kind of bushy, scraggly um, desert, I don't know, whatever, ground cover. It's, it's not really ground cover. It's like little bushes and things like that. I wanted some of that stuff out there. Here, let me grab you know, that Ocotillo again here, or a couple of them. You know, in the desert, it's not like this is like bare, you know, floor without any ground cover. You know, it's, there's a lot of uh, ground, you know, like bushes and things like that. Or a lot of people think, you know, they're thinking of, most people when they think of um, deserts, they're, they're usually thinking of like the Sahara Desert or something like that, you know, with a, like roll, you know, there's sand dunes everywhere, you know, and that's, not what most of them are like. There are, if there are sand dunes somewhere, like in Death Valley or something like that, it's like in one or two, three little sections of it. And the rest are, you know, it's not like that at all. You know, like I said, in the U.S. You know, kind of there's isolated areas. Okay, so anyways, little ground covery types of stuff out there. And that's, you know, I wanted to put that type of thing at the foot of it. That's what I was kind of missing in that first set. It's like, you know, I can build it out of um, that stuff, out of uh, existing Stampscapes designs. Um, but, um, you know, I wanted it in the set and kind of more specific to the desert environment. That being said, that type of ground cover, you can use it anywhere too. It doesn't have to be a desert. Okay, well, um, maybe the, I don't know if these are longhorns right here. Little cattle um, skull. That, I don't know if I would use that like in a forest environment or something like that, but. That little thing that cracks me up. And I'm looking for details in the horns, and it's all in there. You know, those little, um, 
what do you call them, like little ribs or something like that. Um, yeah. Hey, I'm not into the little creepy crawlers like, uh, you know, little um, tarantulas either. But I sure like them in this uh, kind of desert environment. I grew up in um, central California, and uh, there's supposed to be a lot of uh, tarantulas out there, kind of in the chaparral area. I never saw one until I was, like, biking from uh, Lompoc to... Uh, Kind of the Solvang area, if you've heard of that. And uh, it was just right on the, the highway there. It's like, oh, there's a tarantula. It's so bizarre. Because we used to go out kind of hiking around all the time. All right, this isn't in scale. I'm just stamping out that snake. There's a lot of patterning in that snake right there. And I'm looking at the base of it. And it has retained all the information that I wanted in that. So that came out perfect. That was that was kind of the, one of the main ones because that one had a lot of um, patterning to it. All right, now this little uh, vulture right here. Um, yeah, his head shows up and I've got little kind of patterning in that back wing. The front wing right here is kind of a lot of... Um, we've got a white space in the back wing. It's mostly silhouette, but I put those little... Um, kind of defining features in that back wing too. And again, this is a, a really juicy pad right here. So that would potentially fill up all those little negative spaces that are in there, but it didn't, it, which I'm glad to see that. I like uh, Marving too, cause it's really a, it's a thin, very dense ink. It's thin in viscosity. So you retain a lot of information, um, but it's really dense in terms of, um, you know, trying to, you know, achieve like a true black. All right, here's my bighorn sheep. Um, bighorn sheeps are something that when you see them out in nature, you are really kind of feeling like, oh my gosh, you know, you, like you saw um, in terms of desert kind of adventures, uh, like you saw a unicorn or something like that. And that has retained that information in the uh, the body right there, okay? Those are like, that's like light hitting it right there. Sometimes people say, oh, there's a hole in it. Well, we're not doing kind of silhouettes here. You know, that's, that's how you define some area like that. I'm not saying people said that about that, but they said it on my, like my buck and deer before. They don't understand kind of the, when you, it's like rounded like that. See that how my knuckles right there are light like that. And the rest of it is a little bit darker. So you got to, you know, define that in light and shade. And here's my little jackrabbit right here. And you can see the um, defining feature on its little haunch right there. The back of the, um, it's back right there. So it's being backlit kind of. Um, and that's what I wanted to see. So the design choice was, all right, do I fill in that little space between that shadow and the silhouette of its back like that? Or do I retain that little tiny thin line like that and you know what I mean you take a chance of it disappearing so I kind of made it thick enough to retain it and it's and it's perfect right there let's see if I've got everything in these impressions right here I think I did um, I'll try these out I wanted to try my next thing is I'm going to try them on some uh, my different papers like this you know, the cool kind of wood grain papers and vintage papers. And I'll try it with my, probably my hybrid ink combination of pigment and dye. You know, you think it's really thick, but it's, it's pretty good. It's, it's thinner than you think it would be for having um, pigment ink in it as well. So, okay. So we have the, um, the three Ocotillos. All right. Those look great. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Saguaros. We have our big horn that we tried out, the jackrabbit. Oh, this is why I'm kind of going over it like this, one by one. I forgot my little desert tortoise. Can't forget with that one. Now that one was just, I've seen more um, 
desert, maybe seeing a desert tortoise is more like seeing a, like a unicorn or something like that out in the desert. For me, at least, I've seen a lot of uh, bighorn sheep just came up on them by accident some you know or by chance and there's our little turtle tortoise okay so we see the tight detail there is some super tight detail in there in the negative space in its shell patterning and that got all of it so my engraver and my rubber guy they nailed it thank you to them for you know i don't know whatever uh plate making perfection and pre plate making and pressing perfection because we all benefit from it as stampers we got our skull snake a little desert brush and uh, tarantula in here i'll be getting these all kind of packaged up and things like that thanks everyone for your support and for those that have ordered it and for those that you know order it in the future thank you for supporting the line and um I can't wait to use these in complete scenes and uh, see what we can do with them. We have our desert set number one as well, and I've been really enjoying that. I've been using the rocks especially for this, but when I start using things like these Joshua trees, it really um, I find it a really super evocative process because when I see that imagery done, you know, on paper and done in scenes, it really just it's like my mind keeps saying, okay, I want to see that in this type of light and that type of light, this time of day, nighttime on foils with a moon behind it or something like that. It really just, it's just this um, constant kind of conjuring up or, you know, process of uh, thinking of, oh, I can't wait to see this and this other type of thing. And then inevitably you kind of forget about it because, you know, as you're working on one of those things, you forgot about that fifth thing you thought about it before, but another, you know, six or seven things come to mind as far as usage goes but these things should all be really fun to use you know there's all kinds of like really super dramatic um desert skies especially between you know whatever the golden hours of morning light and you know sunset but then twilights and uh you know the skies the color at night even or the stars you know i tend to associate that with seeing more stars you know than having a lot of city lights around um, but, uh, yeah, really fun stuff. All right. Thanks for watching.